Welcome to the Sustainability Agenda podcast. My name is Fregel Byrne. Every week I speak to leading sustainability thinkers and practitioners, scientists, economists, NGOs, business leaders and investors. We discuss the sustainability imperative, the key challenges, the latest thinking, and what's working in sustainability, resilience and regeneration. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Jason Hickel back to the Sustainability Agenda podcast. Jason is an economic anthropologist, author, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He is a visiting senior fellow at the International Inequalities Institute at the London School of Economics and senior lecturer at Goldsmiths, University of London. His most recent book is Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World. So thank you very much, Jason, for joining me once again on the Sustainability Agenda podcast. Yes, my pleasure. It's good to be back, Fergal. Yes, uh, it's a uh, lot's happened <laughs> since we last spoke, for sure. Maybe just for our <laughs> listeners, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, your work, your preoccupations, Jason. Sure, yeah. So I am originally from Eswatini, a small country in Southern Africa. Uh, I studied in the US and um, I'm living in London these days. I'm an economic anthropologist um, at the LSE and also at Goldsmiths University of London. And I work on international developments and issues of global inequality and colonial history and increasingly now also on ecological economics, which is kind of my main focus. And I have a a new book that just came out um, this year uh, that basically provides an introduction to degrowth and post-growth thinking, and it's called Less is More. Yes, and we're going to talk about that. I'm very much looking forward to a fascinating, wide-ranging book with lots of ideas, lots to think about. Now, before we go on to talk about about, about uh, degrowth and post-growth and so forth, uh, just wondering, uh, in particular, the time that's uh, elapsed since we last spoke, but today there seems to be tremendous momentum. There seems to be a big shift uh, in terms of uh, governments, particularly in the United States, uh, not only in terms of awareness and acceptance of climate change, but also uh, in terms of commitments to net zero, the world of business, uh, tsunami, or, wrong word, but uh, more and more <laughs> corporations making significant commitments to net zero, financial institutions doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, should we be optimistic is uh, just a question I want to start with. And let's start with business because it's, it's um, uh, Mark Carney said that this, that net zero was the greatest economic opportunity of our age. We see it it's, it's it's a dominant theme in the the, the the business press, and you know huge commitments on the face of it. Uh, what it looked like to net zero and a growing number of corporations doing that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, clearly we should welcome uh, many of these new targets. Obviously, especially the U.S. one is a major shift in ambition from the Trump administration. So that's quite important. Uh, at the same time, we should recognize that there are several significant problems that unfortunately, because of the excitement around these new commitments, have kind of fallen out of our conversation. So the first problem is this, that the new uh, Biden administration plan is in fact not consistent with, uh, with, uh, with, with keeping temperatures under 1.5 degrees Celsius as per the Paris Agreement. So that's a problem. The second issue is that it grossly violates climate justice principles. Now, what I mean by this is the fact that um, under the Paris Agreement, we know that to keep emission, to keep temperatures under 1.5 or 2 degrees, um, uh, the global economy needs to reduce emissions to zero by 2050. But that's a global average target. We know that high-income nations, because they are responsible for the vast majority of historical emissions, they need to decarbonize much more quickly. And the consensus on this is um, a fair rate of decarbonization would be around reaching zero by 2030. So, um, so effectively, the U.S. and other um, rich nation climate plans that aim for 2050 are violating this principle of climate justice and are continuing to colonize the shared atmospheric space that uh, um, that rightly that rightfully belongs to poorer countries. Effectively, right. So right. that's I could, yeah. When, when you talk about uh, 1.5, I mean, I've seen. Uh, I think uh, a number of scientists recently were, wrote about net zero and they were saying, nobody, that's not really a realistic figure. It's already probably in the atmosphere already. We're looking at two degrees. Some people say three degrees. Um, probably a, a, a lot to discuss there. But in terms of a step forward, in terms not just the symbolism, but it, it, it really is a big step. It's, it's, a, it's a significant uh, increase in, in the commitment. And it's, it seems to be building. 
Yes, yes. I mean, clearly it's a, it's objectively better than what we had before, but it is also objectively inadequate. And I think we have to underline that fact. Um, and, and clearly, especially from the perspective of the Global South, I mean, if you read Global South uh, media reports on these plans, they're actively calling out the fact that these are inadequate, right? That they violate the principle of climate justice, which, which is in the Paris Agreement. So this is not good enough. And, the, and Western media has not done a good job of, of raising this this concern. Right. Yeah. Is there a question here? Because when you look even at the scale of the commitments that the, that, that, that the Biden's made today, it, it entails a massive change in, in, in the way the economy operates, the scale of the, the economy, uh, even just looking at it at, at the level that it, it operates today. How do you square this question of, of what governments can do and what the populace feel. I mean, America famously polarized. Uh, there has been some movement, but still extremely divided on, on political lines. Um, is, is there some sense in which, you know, there is a, a window of possibility? And, and, and I think many people would, would, would say that Biden has done much more or, or whether what happens and how, whether he gets it through or not. It's another question, but has made uh, uh, these steps m- in a much more dramatic way than anybody possibly could have imagined. Is there not also a danger of, of, of overstepping the mark, of, of jumping in there and, and, and making commitments that, that are going to entail such a massive change that the, the people won't just won't put up with it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's quite right, because if we, look at, um, if we look at surveys coming out of Europe recently, we find that a majority of people in European countries actually support much more ambitious targets. So they, so they clearly support, um, explicitly support uh, uh, zero by 2030 targets, right? And that's um, that's a dr- that's they say that they say dr- that Jason, but the reality of you know when we start to see these things, they're quite complicated. We saw what happened to Gijon in France with the with the diesel tax. Uh, so surveys are, are one thing, and I guess Europe is an, is another compared to the United States. Um, it's not a big issue, and and you know I, I guess it, it, it's it's a it's something you could discuss one way or another. No, I mean to me this is quite important. I mean. If, uh, I think that the um, the main obstacles to aggressive uh, uh, climate policy are not average people. Actually, they are elites because there are significant industries that are going to have to, you know, that are going to have to scale down. Specifically, the fossil fuel industry and the auto the automotive industry, et cetera, um, in, in order to make these kinds of ambitions feasible. Right. So now or or, or recent. Um, Jean, I mean, look, the the, the way that these uh, that's um, um, that uh, the the policy was introduced in France uh, was extremely re- you know regressive. I mean, it actively hurt the working class while yeah. letting richer people yeah. off the hook. I mean, so this is a lesson to us, which is that which is that you know principles of equity and justice um, uh, have to be at the core of 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 any shift towards aggressive climate policy, and that's something that France did. Uh, uh, absolutely, but if you're operating in a, in a situation where they're not already, you know, these principles of justice that we're talking about aren't embedded in the, the kind of state of capitalism, the state of the world economy today. So this, you know, uh, th- there seems to be a kind of a trade-off, this, this urgency need need to move forward. But if you're operating within a, a power structure, within a system of, of, of relationships and operations that already, you know, are, are inequitable, that don't have these principles established at the center of them, what's going to happen well this is why we have to call for a significant social change and it's as simple as that right i mean there's just there's no sense in calling for radical climate policy if you're not also um, addressing significant underlying social inequities and so this has to be uh, you know this has to be part of our conversation and right and right now it's not you know to, to be to be frank right now we're, we're discussing the climate crisis as a matter of technology rather than as a matter of um, of social transformation. And we need to bring the latter you know, into the picture as well. And, and the reason is because of this, because we know that um, it's, it's certainly possible for rich nations like the US and UK to decarbonize by 2030, um, right? Consistent with people's actual desires and demands. The tricky part is that this is not possible to achieve um, with, uh, you know, with our existing commitments to perpetual economic growth. And the reason is because more growth uh, means more energy demands, and more energy demands makes rapid decarbonization significantly more difficult to achieve. It's kind of like running yeah. up a down escalator or something like that, right? You sort of, it's a difficult battle to fight. And so yeah. in ecological economics, we call for a fundamentally different approach that high, high income nations should abandon GDP growth as an objective and actively scale down excess energy use so that we can decarbonize more quickly. And that, and, and that can be done in a fair and just way. And that's what we call for. 
Okay, and I, I'd like to come on to that in a moment, but just the, the other uh, element of the, the the momentum, the shift, the 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 optimism, maybe in terms of, uh, or, or certainly the the um, discussion of these topics is the uh, momentum around net zero and corporations committing to to net zero uh, in, in, in over various time frames. Yes, I mean. Um... Uh, again, I mean, I, I absolutely welcome it. I think this is important momentum. It's cl- clearly the conversation has changed now from a couple of years ago. Um, uh, I, I worry a little bit about about the net zero language. The net zero framing is quite concerning, actually, because we know that this leaves significant loopholes for offsets, uh, specifically, which we know to be problematic. And it also leaves loopholes for um for negative emissions uh, uh, schemes like BECS, for example, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is very widely assumed in you know, existing IPCC climate mitigation scenarios. So, and, and these are considered to be quite problematic um, uh, by scientists for a variety of reasons we can discuss. But the crucial thing is that the net zero framing is, 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 maybe, is, is easy and maybe attractive, but we need to be calling for something much firmer, which is uh, which is, you know, a clear commitment to zero emissions by um, specific dates consistent with the Paris Agreement, and ultimately, what that requires is binding commitments to reduce fossil fuel use with something like a declining annual cap. I mean, that, that's the, you know, that's the way to to realize these pledges. I mean, the, the the pledges and words are great, but we need clear policy commitments. And what's interesting to me is that reading the Biden plan as published on the White House website. Um, it doesn't even mention fossil fuels. Uh, and to me, that's a red flag. <laughs> I think that we have to have a more explicit conversation about um, about actively scaling down fossil fuel use. Yeah, big topic. Uh, we'll see if we can get that in, in a little bit later. I want to come to the heart of, 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 of what you, you're, you're interested in at the moment, what you're writing about, what less is more is about, and what's, what's, what's a really rich uh, intellectual area, certainly uh, the whole question of degrowth. Um, now, I, I, it's, I was thinking about it uh, today, and I was thinking what, one, one of the issues maybe that I have with it is a little bit it's it's hard to somehow I guess uh conceptualize something that's not something <laughs> you know uh the absence of something uh so you know the, the absence of growth um thinking about that and I'm just wondering it's called degrowth how is that less different let's say from, from less growth and, and and why would you say that uh I won't get ahead of ourselves here, but but uh, <laughs> conventional economists have, have have pretty much taken against it in in pretty uh, strong terms. Yeah, it's really interesting to see. Um, I mean, degrowth has been these ideas have been around for a long time, for about ten years, um, uh, and they have they have an interesting history, which maybe we can discuss. But what's interesting is that only in the past couple of years have they have these ideas exploded into mainstream discourse and. Um, and research uh, is moving really quickly on this front, and social movements are taking it up. Um, and to my surprise, it's become um, a really quite popular idea in lots of circles. Now, okay, so what is degrowth? Um, we, you know, we define it as a planned reduction of excess resource and energy use in high-income nations designed to bring the economy back into balance with the living world in a safe, just, and equitable way. So this is fundamentally different from, say, a recession, which is unplanned, chaotic, destructive uh, to poor people, um, has has marginal uh, benefits in terms of ecological impacts, and ends up, you know, increasing inequality, et cetera. So, so we, you know, so we have a different word for this because it's a fundamentally different thing. It's an analytical term that is clearly defined in the ecological economics literature, and the main, I, I guess, the main principle here is that. Instead of assuming that all sectors of the economy should grow all the time, which is the existing orthodox economics assumption, we should think about instead what sectors we actually want to expand, things like renewable energy, public transportation, public health care, you know, et cetera, um, and what sectors are clearly too big and are socially less necessary and should be actively scaled down, right? Things like um, SUV production, private jet production, fast fashion, industrial beef, advertising, the arms industry, et cetera. Um, so we argue that this is a more rational way to manage an economy um, rather than this kind of aggregate approach where, I mean, I mean, think about it. In our existing economy, we pursue GDP growth. $100 of tear gas 
is um, considered equivalent to $100 of education, right? This is, this is crazy. So we have to take a more, a more rational approach to the way that we, that we manage the economy. Now, um, orthodox economists, as you noted, have taken against degrowth primarily because they start from the assumption that more GDP is necessary for improving human well-being. Um, and that's, this is just a taken for granted assumption that people operate with. Um, but interestingly, there is in fact no evidence for this um, because we know that past a certain point, which high income nations have long since surpassed, the relationship between GDP and social indicators breaks down or becomes neg uh, negligible. So what actually matters in terms of people's well-being, livelihoods, and so on, is um, a fair distribution of income and access to universal public services that people need to live good lives. The empirical evidence is very clear that this is what delivers strong social outcomes and um, life satisfaction and happiness, et cetera, et cetera. So the key thing here is that you want to um, organize the economy to meet people's needs directly rather than hoping GDP growth will somehow magically trickle down to do that for you, right? Which is a sort of a rational assumption. Um, so yeah, so in other, in other words, organize the economy around meeting human needs and ecological regeneration rather than around perpetual growth and elite accumulation. And the exciting thing about this is that we, have, um, we now have uh, really fantastic evidence showing that we can achieve um, you know, high levels of human well-being with significantly less resource and energy use than high income nations uh, presently use, right? Like, and, and by, by significantly less, I mean in the region of 80% less, okay? So it's, we know it's fully possible to scale down resource and energy use to sustainable levels consistent with rapid decarbonization um, and at the same time deliver flourishing lives for all. Uh, the reason that our economies don't do that, I mean, right now we have economies where we have high levels of resource use and tremendous amounts of poverty, and even in high income nations. Why? Precisely because our economies are organized around elite accumulation rather than around human needs. So the scholarship in, economic, in ecological economics wants to reverse that. Um, and, uh, and again, we have evidence to demonstrate this is more than possible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's apparent that a simple word uh, packs in a lot of material and a lot of ideas in there to discuss. Who is the audience for these ideas? I mean, people in the street are, 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 I mean, walking around thinking about economic growth as an idea. It's quite abstract. Who, 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 who's the audience that you're, you know, that these ideas are being presented to to bring to to bring on board to convince them that this is a a, a powerful way of reframing and thinking about what we do economically? Yeah. So, um, I mean, clearly, this uh, this this term uh, circulates primarily in two spaces. The first is in, in academic research. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, degrowth is an, is, a, is an analytical term that is used um, in ecological economics and is increasingly being taken up across heterodox economics approaches, right? So there's, there's lots of interesting synergies that are happening. The second place is in social movements. And this is interesting because, um, uh, because demands for degrowth in high income nations actually come largely from the global South. I mean, the deep roots of this idea um, lie in the global south uh, in the anti-colonial struggle, actually, um, where global south nations have been recognizing the fact, or social movements in global south nations have recognized that um, that high levels of consumption in the global north uh, are colonizing, you know, shared atmospheric space and causing ecological breakdown in the south, um, and also um, putting extraordinary pressure on resource extractivism in the global south with with sig significant. Uh, um, negative implications for southern ecosystems and communities, and so um, degrowth has been a demand for for global justice in the sense of look, we have to share this planet. Um, you're over, you know, you're overusing resources and energy. Uh, so the global north needs to needs to reduce and converge with the global south at levels of resource use that are consistent with universal well being. Uh, you know, wow. and, and ecological stability. So ultimately, this is, you know, this emerges from, from the global justice movements, uh, but has strong ties to, um, to, uh, to research in, uh, in climate mitigation. 
right? Because when you talk about the global, global north, that, that again, probably is not exactly correct, is it? Because we, we know that it is the wealthiest top percentage that, that uh, accounts for, you know, by and large, a huge, 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 I've got what the figure is something like, is it 1% accounts for 40%, uh, something like that. But, uh, you know, massive bias towards the wealthiest people. So it's not the global north per se, it's the, the 1%. Yes, yeah, true. I mean, of course, you know, our data on on emissions and resource use is primarily um, bounded at the national level. And so this is why we use countries as units of analysis. That's, of course, also where, um, where you know, the level at which legislation and policy happens. And so it, it is meaningful to talk about countries. But at the same time, you're right. Within countries in the global north, there's significant disparities in um, in, uh, you know, between classes when it comes to responsibility for this problem. Now, crucially, I want to point something out, which is a really essential to, um, to degrowth research, which is to say, this is not actually a matter of individual consumption habits and responsibility, right? Like the mainstream environments movement has, has, um, has predominantly focused on a narrative of individual responsibility and degrowth uh, rejects that discourse. I mean, of course, um, you know, we know that uh, we need to make individual choices to whatever, turn off the lights and fly less and eat less beef, et cetera. That's clearly important. But at the same time, um, we want to point to the, the deeper structure of the economic system, which is a system that is organized around and dependent on perpetual expansion. And, and in such a system, uh, individuals become victims because you have a system that overproduces for the sake, again, of... Um, primarily elite accumulation. And then uh, uh, people have to somehow mop up that overproduction. So we get bombarded with advertisements and planned obsolescence, et cetera, to, to, uh, to maintain, to sort of mop up the excess production that the system generates. And so ultimately, um, the, you know, the problem is our, is our capitalist economic system. Uh, and, uh, and we need to address the problem at that structural cause. Are uh, degrowthers and green growthers good bedfellows? <laughs> um, no, I mean, obviously, there, there have been really uh, engaging and sometimes heated debates between uh, green growth proponents and degrowth uh, researchers. Well, what's at stake here, ideologically, or in terms of the ideas? There's been tr- there, there does seem to be, I hate to use the word again, momentum uh, with, 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 green, with green growth, the Green New Deal, and so forth. Um, it, it's got to be a good thing, no? Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by green growth. Um, the, you know, the main problem that, uh, that, um, that degrowth research has pointed out, okay, and, and this is quite crucial, is that there are, there, are, there are significant empirical questions to be raised about green growth narratives, right? Um, now, this is no small thing. Um, uh, ecological economics um, is, is scientifically rigorous, uh, specifically because it knows it has to go up against these dominant assumptions in public discourse and in neoclassical and orthodox thought. And so um, this, is, this is interesting research. We effectively are able to demonstrate that, look, when it comes to the relationship between GDP and energy, um, more GDP growth means more energy demands relative to what it would otherwise be. And that makes decarbonization more difficult and, um, and probably impossible to achieve the Paris Agreement goals with growth as usual. Which is why you get, you know, green growthers end up relying on um, uh, crazy uh, net negative emissions technology schemes or geoengineering or unprecedented uh, rates of efficiency improvement, et cetera. I mean, we can always dream, right? That's fantastic. But ultimately, we're facing a significant existential crisis that requires a hard-nosed approach to empirical evidence. And the empirical- okay, so can I stop you there and ask a question? So, you, are you saying that empirically, this empirically, the degrowth is on stronger foundations than green growth is? Yes, yes, it is clearly. And I say that as someone who's deeply engaged in this research, and as someone who used to be um, a proponent of green growth narratives, and had to change my mind uh, uh, upon engaging with this literature. Sorry, sorry, what's the evidence here? What, what's the difference in the the empirical uh, evidence, the the strength of 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 the arguments? Yes, well, this is what I was trying to explain with relation to the the energy GDP relation, right? So, um, so again, rising GDP entails rising energy demands, makes it more difficult to decarbonize quickly, um, and so as a result, you get uh, you get scenarios that have to square. You know, you know, have to reconcile um, perpetual GDP growth with with uh, Paris climate targets by relying on things like um, unprecedented rates of technological efficiency improvements and negative emissions technologies, et cetera. If you take those out of the equation or accept more realistic um, assumptions, 
then you're forced yeah. to um to to face a different kind of reality which is that the only way to accomplish decarbonization consistent with paris agreement targets is to actively scale down energy use um, and we have to have a conversation about what that about what that looks like so in degrowth scholarship we um, we say this should be done directly uh, we should actively uh, scale down unnecessary industries industries that are clearly not uh, are not necessary for human well-being and we can and anyone can identify what those are it also entails ending the practice of planned obsolescence you know extending product lifespans introducing rights to repair to reduce material throughput reducing material throughput obviously reduces energy demand as well we can limit advertising we can shift from private cars to public transportation etc cetera, etc cetera. these are all ways that we can actively scale down energy demand also scale down resource use and uh, and achieve rapid decarbonization and reverse ecological breakdown um, now, the question then becomes, you know, when we talk about these kinds of policies, the question always becomes, what about jobs? And this is an important question. And the reason we can't have conversations so far about scaling down unnecessary industries is because of the question of jobs, right? We can't even talk about closing coal plants or airports or, um, you know, et cetera, uh, much less whatever SUV production, et cetera, because of the question of jobs. And so how does ecological economics deal with this question, they propose a, a quite simple answer, um, which is to shorten the working week. Uh, um, so basically, as our economy requires less labor, then we shorten the working week and distribute and, you know, and share necessary labor more evenly uh, to maintain full employment. And so livelihoods are not affected. And this, at the same time, we call for a significant, uh, significantly fair distribution of income. So again, livelihoods are not affected. This is a justice-oriented approach. Um, and also we call for the uh, significant expansion of public services, again, so that people have access to the resources they need to live flourishing lives um, without needing an ever-growing economy in order to do so. So these policy interventions are quite well thought out, and, um, and we know that they would work. But the main obstacle, again, is not, um, is not ordinary people. The main obstacle is... Um, is, you know, uh, powerful class factions <laughs> that stands to lose because they benefit so prodigiously from the existing, you know, growth-oriented system. Very, very, very interesting. I mean, some of what you say sounds very similar to some socialist ideas that you hear around, but that don't seem to get very much time and don't get seem to, um, you know, People don't take those ideas seriously. Are very critical of, of of socialist ideas. Well, I mean, what we're effectively calling, I mean, in terms of the um, in terms of the social dimensions, uh, what I've described is effectively not dissimilar from you know robust social democratic welfare states that are widely used, or you know, in Northern Europe at least before the neoliberal attack. <laughs> so there's nothing particularly outlandish about them. We also know that they're very they're very popular, right? We know that. Um, you know, universal public health care and education are extremely popular. We know that um, things like a shorter working week and a job guarantee pull very high. These are popular policies. Um, now, uh, um, now, there's a question to be asked, though. You know, given the fact that uh, the policies I've described are, you know, are popular, um, why is it that our existing economy doesn't look this way or why are we not having conversations about this? And I think the main reason is that um, we don't really have very democratic societies, right? Like our media um, landscape is uh, is primarily dominated by by corporate interests, and in the UK, billionaires, right, who control the press in large part, um, uh, in terms of the tabloid press, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but also, our political system is largely is largely captured in the sense of. Um, you know, uh, big money can buy political campaigns, and we know how that works. And that um, that really does limit yeah. it. Really does limit the extent to which. Um, it's very interesting. You you, you say that, and and um, clearly strong arguments, as you say, uh, for the capture, political capture, uh, for the media, and so forth. So I guess that raises the question of of the kinds of policies that we need uh, to actually institute this 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 kind of uh, degrowth uh, economic scenario. It, one gets the impression that the that there's a lot of bottom up uh, ideas here, but at the same time, institutional broad institutional changes would be needed. We've seen 
a very rapid change, in, whether it's temporary or not, in the in conceptualization of the role of government in, 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 in the economy in general uh, during the COVID crisis. Is, is that good news for, for people who think about degrowth? What is the relationship, the necessary relationship between uh, it, institutional change, political change, and, and degrowth. Yeah, this is interesting. It's interesting you raised the COVID question because, I mean, uh, okay, on the one hand, let's face it, right? The COVID crisis um, was a classic recession that was deeply destructive to poor people and increased inequality, et cetera, right? So there's nothing about that that we actually that we actually want in terms of what happened to the economy. At the same time, there are clearly things that happens that we can learn from. So for example, uh, the crisis demonstrated that governments actually have the power to scale down whole sectors of the economy at the touch of a button, when previously we were told, obviously, this is impossible. Now, imagine that instead of closing down things like schools and cafes and gyms, things that we actually need and are actually really important to human well-being and conviviality and, uh, you know, and so on, what if instead we use that power to scale down um, you know, SUV production, industrial beef, the, the industrial beef industry, the arms industry, et cetera. Um, we, we now know that governments have the power to do that. We've seen that in action. And so what if we use that power differently? And this time, um, instead of allowing mass unemployment to happen, you do as, as we've called for, which is to shorten the working week, maybe introduce a, a public job guarantee, again, a very popular policy um, to allow people to get well-paying jobs, uh, doing socially necessary things like ecological...